Hi, it's Cayman Reynolds, and welcome to tonight's live chat. I hope you all are doing good. We have a lot to discuss. It is go time. It's that magical part of the beekeeping season, at least here in Tennessee and a lot of the southern states, where we're seeing copious amounts of pollen. Some of us are already seeing some nectar. Some of us have honey supers being filled in the deep south, and some of us are just getting our season going, and maybe some of us are still in banks of snow. Uh, whatever it is, we're all busy prepping or in the thick of it. So I hope you have some questions for me tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Tar Hill Beekeeper. How you doing, Randy? Hope you're doing good. All right. Going through fourth year beekeeping. And this year I'm committed to learning and becoming successful at grafting. When building my cell builder, how long should I leave it before installing uh, my cell bar? So... A lot of times when I do, I, I have a couple systems and there's several ways to raise queens. I was just talking to a friend of mine who raises queens about this because there's a lot of different ways to do it. So there's the starter finisher where you put them in there, of course, and it starts at the cells and finish the cells. And then you have what's uh, a starter and then you have another colony, which is the finisher. And then you have some that are queenless <laughs> starter finishers and you have some that are queen right part of the time. And so what I prefer to do with any of those systems is set it up that morning and then I will leave a frame of young larvae in there if I'm planning to graft that day or even the next day. And so what this does is they figure out very quickly that they're queenless. I personally think it, it does better if you wait one day because they're going through a little bit of stress as you create that. So what we want to do is give them a little bit of very thin sugar syrup. It can be half a pound of sugar to one pound of water. So it's it's very thin, but we're not trying to really add a lot of weight here. We're trying to stimulate, and I feed a pollen patty as well. I'm going to have a frame of bee bread, at least one frame next to that grafting bar, and then where the graft frame's going in, that's where I'm going to be placing that frame of young larvae and, and do it the day that I set it up. And then when I'm ready to graft, best to wait a day. You can do it the same day, but typically it pays to wait one day. Pull that frame of larvae. And now you'll have a couple things going for you. First of all, you already have a ton of young bees who are in the mode of creating royal jelly because that's what all larvae get the first uh, short period of their development. And then if you wait a day or two, they will start making their own queen cells and you can actually uh, scoop the royal jelly from those queen cells and use that to prime your cup. So um, that's what I would do. I think some of the problems that people have um, with doing it immediately is, is the bees aren't quite ready for it. So I think that's really helpful. Is Corey in here tonight? Uh-oh. We, we're talking about queen rearing. Yep, Stevens Bee Company. We might get blown away in southeast Missouri. Tornado warning. No, we've already had too many tornadoes this year. We've reached our limit. Um, I hope that um, one does not touch down, and it just needs to blow on through. But it doesn't need to blow our trampoline away either. So um, I, I'm fixing to go stake that down um, before uh, the night's over. Oh, more wind. It's that time of the year. Looking forward to seeing you at the two-day ISBA summer meeting in Quincy in July. That's right. That's one of the few meetings that I'm doing this year and uh, left for this year. I'm, I'm slowing that roll down a little bit, but I am really looking forward to that one quite a bit. And that will be, like you said, in Quincy, Illinois, and promises to be very exciting, um, primarily because I've got plenty of bad jokes for uh, Randy McCaffrey, uh, Natalie Summers, and Corey Stevens, all of who will be there as well and there's going to be several other people there um so yeah it's going to be going to be wild it might not be educational but it's going to be wild our trampoline has already been taco well if you quit jumping on it steven uh Corey, <laughs> uh it, it, it it wouldn't be so roughed up during this time of the year when temps are going up and down hive sizes are going up and down how do you store a brood comb so moths don't destroy it so steven uh, I don't have any paramoth crystals or anything that I've done. I haven't used any sprays like a Sertan, which is a BT. 
um, that can be used as well. I've never uh, tried it. So um, I have talked to guys who have, and they say, eh, okay. All I do is put some hardware cloth on the top and the bottom to where mice can't get into them. And if it's a nine frame honey super or a nine frame deep or 10 frame, whatever, I'll drop it down to eight. So there's a lot more space in there. It doesn't need to be too tall and it needs to be able to have some natural sunlight get in there. That doesn't mean it can get rained in, but I have an open shed, a couple of them that I have access to and daylight does get in there and I have great success with that. Um, that's all I do. And maybe every now and then I'll lose a handful of combs, but I might lose maybe two supers worth of combs a year, which seems like a lot, but I can draw hundreds in a year. So that, that's all I do. And I don't have to worry about any chemicals or anything like that. Uh, works very, very good for me. Some people say that you can't do it. I do it. So, and I know several people who do. Hello from South Central Michigan. I have boxes of honey I got from someone. Should I put a super on with a queen excluder so my bees can rob out those boxes and store it in my supers? If it's real honey, um, sure, I guess so. Um, why? Um, if it's in... So you have boxes of honey. So these boxes are frames of honey, right? So could you not extract these? Or are we talking like boxes of jars of honey? Or something like that, which if that's the case, you know, I don't know. I mean, if it's already in a frame, why not extract it the way that it is? Um, my biggest concern is some diseases um, can pass through honey. European fowl brood, for example, and, and a couple others. So um, maybe maybe you can elaborate on that. And if I see it, um, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. All right. Next question. Next question. Hello from Texas. Going on vacation for two weeks of summer, end of June. Wondering how to keep them fed while I'm away. Should I do some sugar bricks to leave with them? So you're going to be gone two weeks. And that's not too awful bad. My recommendation for summer beekeeping is check your bees every other week on the low end. Um, so two weeks isn't that bad. If you can get to it right before you leave and then you get to them right before you get back, um, you should be okay. And what I would do, Rachel, is prior to your trip, monitor them a little bit more because what we want to do, I don't know what it's like in Texas in June, but it sounds like it's probably a dearth period. Um, it, it typically is um, here at the end of June, so I imagine it would be for you. And if it is, what you can do is early in June, whenever the honey supers are off or maybe they're young colonies so they don't have any honey, just make sure that there's already plenty on there enough to last for quite a while. And so what would that be? I never want to see a big colony with less than three deep frames worth of honey or sugar syrup ever. Um, if they if they have less than that, which that's around 21 pounds, uh, the, the queen will not lay right and the colony will hold back. So before you go, let's say you have a double deep, maybe a month in advance, go out there and see what you have. And, and then just start feeding until you get to that point. And then maybe give them a little bit before you go. And then they should be fine over that two week period without you having to do anything like sugar bricks or anything like that. And you can just feed a one to one sugar syrup. And right before you go, here's the thing. If you got a one gallon feeder, you can make two to one or, or something thick like that and feed it in summer. There's no, there's no rule saying that you can't do that. And it's twice as thick. So if you feed a gallon of two to one, it's like feeding two gallons of one to one and the bees don't care. So anyways, hope that helps. Ah, J.C. Apiary. The boxes are dirty and the comb is dirty. <laughs> well, that would be a good reason why. Um, you know, that's up to you. Um, they, they will um, they will feed that uh, uh, feed that out of the combs and uh, and use it. Um, it as long as the, the you feel comfortable about the uh, the safety of you know disease and stuff like that, it probably is fine. But you know, you never know. So. Uh, the bees will clean that up, though, um, a lot better than we ever could. And uh, so let me know how it goes. <laughs> Hi, I'm just east of Memphis. All right, so not too far from me. New beekeeper, I have been having to keep feeding sugar water as my ladies keep consuming all of their stored winter honey. Is this normal around here? It is. It takes a lot of honey um, for bees to overwinter. A strong colony 
in a normal year will burn through 60 pounds of stores. And it could be 80 in a year where it's more mild. And this year, besides a couple of weeks, we were quite mild. And it's really better if we get colder winters than what we do. Um, that's something that's not taught, but it's actually better if we don't get a lot of flying days in wintertime. The bees burn a lot more resources. Um, it wears out their lifespan as well. It would be better if the temperature, once we got into like November, never got to the point where the bees were able to fly until probably around February when our pollen hits. But that never happens, especially, you know, where you're at. You're probably getting half of that where the bees can fly or close to it. And so they're just they're burning through the resources for no reason. So, yes, um, I fed some colonies this week. A lot of mine were were good, but there was a couple that were very light. And with all that natural pollen coming in, a good young queen will just lay, lay with reckless abandon. This is one of the times of the year with, where they will really lay with reckless abandon. And I actually had a colony starve on me um, two weeks ago, and I was not very happy about it. They were light, and I knew they were. I went on a trip, and I thought I left them enough food. It was not. And five good frames of brood, all kinds of bees dead in the bottom board. And it was really sad. So, yep, that kind of uh, time of the year. Um, but it's it literally can switch like that. And there's people that say you can't ever feed sugar syrup. It's bad for bees, but I'd lose a lot of colonies if it wasn't for that stuff. Okay. What is the best temp for queen cells in an incubator? I typically have mine around uh, 93 degrees. Um, at cert but at certain stages, I'll, I'll, I'll lower it just a little bit. Um, my incubator somewhere around here. Uh... Hmm. I thought I had it in this room, but apparently I moved it. But that uh, incubator I have from, oh goodness, Cutler Beef Supply, um, and they do poultry stuff up north. Uh, it's it's really nice. It's the Genesis um, 88 or something like that, Hova Bader, and those things are really, really accurate. And I think for the price, they, they do a wonderful job. Bob uses them. I use them. A couple other commercial beekeepers use them, but... Um, the most important thing is that you have a good air circulation, so you don't get any cool and hot spots. So you have, need to have a little fan in there and you also need to have a sponge that stays moist the entire process. It doesn't have to be dripping with water in there, but it definitely doesn't need to dry out. Hova Genesis, Genesis 1588 killer mode. What temperature are you running, Corey? All right. While that's going on, I'm going to um, answer this question down there uh, by Frankfurt Fury. Quick thought on Apivar, still good to use. Uh, that is a great question. My opinion is uh, no, not really. Um, there is just tons and tons of beekeepers that I respect that are finding it not doing what it used to do. You don't have to be a researcher to see if something works or not. You go to, you know, 40 hives, 10 hives, whatever it is, and you take some alcohol washes on every one of them. And then you apply the product and you do exactly what it says to do. And then you come back, you remove the strips and then wait. Now, don't do it immediately. Wait a couple weeks because a lot of times these things will still have a, a little bit of a residual effect afterwards. Come back about two, three weeks post treatment and removing strips and then do another alcohol wash and see where you're at. And Bob Benny, myself, several others found that it does not work and it's very expensive. Uh, not good. At, and there's some people that say it still works. There's some people that are saying it. And then they're also telling me on the other side uh, of their mouth that they're having my issues. <laughs> so uh, there, it's a complicated issue. But Apivar... Um, for the money and it being a synthetic as well, which I'm not a huge fan of, um, needs to give me really good knockback. It's, it's a shame because it used to be one of my favorite products to use. I didn't like it as a synthetic, but I still used it because I can make my splits up, requeen them. And it was so gentle, unlike Formic and Apigard, which um, are both you know basically gases going through the hive. 
that uh you know i can i could drop a queen cell with the ape of our kill the mites get a new queen to still uh, not get killed because of the product and then i get my cake and eat it too but it just it doesn't kill like it used to um i, I know too many people who are using the off-label amitraz who are still finding it kicking butt and taking a uh, name so i think amitraz still works uh, the problem is is ape of our doesn't seem to be working what alternative to use? So I use Thymol, and I've actually been using a little bit of Formic this year, um, the Formic Pro from Nod. One of the other things that I use is a moxalic acid vapor. I think that we, we're just at a point where we have to treat a little more often, and we definitely need to be treating smarter. And so one of the things that I've been doing, and I, I plan to continue to do even more aggressively, is making smart splits. That's what I call them anyways. And so we are making splits after our honey flows over, yank those honey supers off, and we will take all the calf brood to one hive. We leave the original colony with the original queen with no calf brood or very, very little. And so all the mites are exposed in there. So any product that you work is going to work really good in that hive. So whether it's Apigard or a little bit of Formic Pro or oxalic acid vapor, which is pretty cheap, give them a couple rounds of oxalic acid vapor just for good measure. Because oxalic acid vapor um, does not get you the 90-something percent kill on average, like they say, in one shot. If it did, I would, well, we won't go there. Anyways, so then the colony where we took all the capped brood, I put a queen cell in there. Or if we're, we have a mated queen that's coming, I'll make the split five days beforehand or so. And then you come back in five days, you cut all the queen cells they're trying to make out, introduce your queen into there. And then you time it to where she's laying for about a week, but it takes nine days for them to cap her brood. And so all that cap brood's emerged. All those mites are exposed. Bam, kill. It takes more time and effort, a little bit of bee math, but you just wipe them out midsummer, and you're in a really good spot. So that's, that's what we're starting to do is make these smart splits because it makes our products more effective. Hey, thanks for coming on, Frank, uh, Frankfurt Fury. That is a little tricky to say. I say that four times fast and it's going to sound awful. So I'm not going to try. 92.7. Well, look at you getting all fancy. Anything right around 93 is ideal. 92.7. You know, one of those queen rearing snobs. That's, that's Corey Sn Stevens for you. <laughs> I will have to say, though, the, cell, the queen cells I got from Corey last year have done really well. They overwintered good. Um, I haven't had time to evaluate, evaluate mite resistance, and the breeder queen that was AI that I got from him um, is still laying very, very strong. Actually, a little too strong. I have to I pull about three frames of bees out of them. They're getting too big. All right, next question. I've watched Bob's double screen board method for creating nukes. Can you point me to a double screen procedure that puts the old queen and the nuke and my new queen in the original colony. So I don't know a particular video on that. However, if you can find your queen, well, you can pull her up above no problem, that double screen board. And then you can put a new queen that you've purchased that's made it down below. Or you can drop a queen cell. Uh, uh, Dean's Bees, what I do all the time and I love this. This is the way I use the double screen board the most. I don't really use them like Bob does at this point where I'm making my nukes with them. I'm considering it and I'm trying it in small doses. Um, what works for Bob doesn't always translate super well for me because I don't have the workforce Bob does. And so I can't do all the some of the convenient stuff that they do um, as well as they do. Obviously, it works. Um, however, what. I find a lot of times if I'm in a colony that I'm like, you yeah, know, this queen's just okay. I'm going to use that double screen board and I'll drop a queen cell or you can drop a mated queen in each side. And that works extremely good. And then if you're using queen cells and one of them doesn't come back, well, you just combine it back and you're right where you started. Insurance, insurance, insurance. Um, it's so important, but I don't know any particular videos. Um, or anything about the old queen and, and the nuke production. But the double screen boards are really flexible. You can get really creative with them. And I don't like extra pieces of equipment, but the double screen board is one that is worth it.
Um, yeah, Chris, I just saw your comment on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. Hey, Dave, thanks for supporting us again, man. Um, I really appreciate you coming on here consistently and helping us out. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. I am admittedly a queen snob. <laughs> uh, well, there's there's worse things out there. It, that's all right. We'll t we tolerate you. Hey, I made a split on 320. I took a peek in it today, and I had six queen cells, two been considerably bigger than the rest. I removed the smaller ones and left two. Should I just leave one or is two okay? Thanks. I would definitely leave two because sometimes something can be going on in that cell that you don't know about. Um, every now and then um, the bees make a mistake and it happens. That's why they make several cells. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's just to cover, you know, their hind ends because they know, you know, it's a percentage game, but it is good whenever you make any walk away splits or any time you're doing anything like that. In my opinion, walk away. Um, it, it, it's too risky for me. So I'm like you, Litecoin. If I was going to do something like that, I'm going back in there. You don't want to get in there when there's a virgin running around. But you can get in there and then you can see which cells look good. Leave two or three or if, heck, if there's four really good queen cells, leave all those. But get rid of those runty looking ones because half the time they're older. They're going to hatch out first. They're going to kill all your prime queens. And uh, some people say bees always get it right. When there is an emergency situation, sometimes they make emergency decisions. And no, bees do not always get it right. Those type get weed out of the, weeded out of the gene pool and they die. <laughs> Better than being a snobby queen, Corey. That's right. Getting warm in New Jersey. Bees are going crazy. Brian Reese, thank you, sir, very much. We appreciate you being our biggest supporter on our live chats and for a very long time, too. And I uh, really appreciate uh, just the continued support. And we're looking forward to getting you some of our nukes um, here in under a month. So they are the bees are building up good here. Um, gosh, this is going to be our earliest nuke pickup um, we've ever had, but everything's a couple weeks earlier than normal. So we're we've uh, I think we've adjusted pretty good. The bees look great, and uh, hopefully the weather will continue to cooperate, and we don't get a really late freeze. I don't think it's going to affect our nukes, but it will affect our our honey flow. First year beekeeper, one of my nukes just swarmed yesterday. I wasn't able to catch it, but I found the capped queen cell. Should I leave the queens to the Thunderdome? Um, I'm not sure. That might have been a typo. Destroy extra cells or try to split. So one of the things that you could do, Daniel, <coughs> with your first, uh, with your nuke um, that it swarmed, is if you have a couple queen cells, you could make a split. Just make sure if you do that, that you shake enough bees. You don't shake the frames with the cells, though. So let's say you have two frames that have good queen cells on them. So you leave one in the original location, and then you take another one to a new nuke box or whatever. And then the frames that do not have any cells on them or that you care about... Shake those into the new box. All the foragers are going to go back to the original location. And so we need to make sure that that other box has plenty of bees in it to keep all of that brood warm and, and all those kind of things. But you can do that to make sh to give yourself a better chance. You might end up with two queens, but you might only end up with one. And if you only have one queen, it doesn't come back well, then you're, you're out of luck. If only one of them comes back, you can recombine them and be right where you left off. David, I've seen you talking about drawing extra combs, running double deeps. Do you put on an extra deep box with foundation for the bees to draw out? Oh, yes, but I don't do it this time of the year. So when I draw most of my deep combs, um, it is either in the nukes that I'm producing for the customer, um, but primarily it's after the honey flow, and this is a, a timing thing. So the best bees for drawing are older bees, um, not like the ones fixing to die tomorrow, but the ones that are... And, and, you know, they're flying age, you know, of course they have to be because when the hive swarms and gets to a new location, they have to be able to fly. And they also have to be able to draw 
wax really good. When they're younger than that, they're really good at royal jelly and worker jelly production. It's crazy all the things that bees can manufacture with their bodies. They are just insane. But now we need some older bees to draw this comb out. So when our honey flow is done, we have these massive colonies with nothing to do. And they're just bearding outside of our colonies. Why not quickly strip all that honey off and quickly uh, get some combs drawn? We have this huge population. We're going to have to feed quite a bit to do it, but that's okay. Um, I, I, honey's worth a lot more than sugar syrup and sugar syrup doesn't hurt bees. And so I'm going to feed them thin sugar syrup, pull a frame of eggs up into that new bit of foundation, and they're going to draw those out. And a good colony will get me a minimum one deep box within a two-week period, if, as long as I feed, feed, feed. And if I do it right and I have a good queen, then I'm going to get two deep boxes per colony. So imagine doing that on 100 hives and just averaging 1.5 on the success rate. And that's 15, that's 1,500 combs right there that I have now for next year. And I have excess combs, actually, um, because it's been working so good for me. And it's a, it's a good problem to have, very good problem to have if you're wanting to expand or make splits or, or more honey production, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, but it's a timing thing. If you wait a month or so after the honey flow, the population is declining because lack of pollen, lack of nectar, the, the bees just naturally decline. So it's more difficult to draw them in late July and August. So we strip them in, in late June and we just hammer them with the feed. It works really good. The only time we have an issue getting them to draw them is when we have queen issues or if there's like really high mite loads. But typically it's a queen issue. We're like, oh, they didn't take their feed. Oh, they're not drawing things right. There's a queen issue. And sure enough, it's a super seizure, queenless, something like that. Feeding can tell you a lot about what's going on in the colony. Hey, ECP, hope you're doing good. Um, Cayman, when do you think you'll open up registration for Hive Life 2024? That likely is going to happen around the same time we did it last year, which is uh, June. So, boy, that's going to be here before we know it. But um, June is when I expect it to open. And thanks uh, so much for supporting us again, uh, Chris. I hope you're doing good and the bees are doing good. Um, look forward to seeing you at uh, some of these events in, in Hive Life uh, 2024. Paul Martins, thanks for supporting us again, Paul. Came any experience with the global patties with the Apis Biologics rocket fuel? I, yeah, I've actually got a couple thousand pounds. Well, I had that much. I still have about half of them to three quarters, uh, somewhere in between that range. And I, I really like them. I like global patties anyways. Um, so when I can't get the rocket fuel ones, um, which basically have to be custom ordered, I just order them from uh, the Bee Supply, which is... Um, it was formerly Texas Bee Supply, um, but the bee, the bee Supply is where I get my global patties from um, when I cannot get them um, with the rocket fuel. But at our conference, we had those available. Now I was informed um, by uh, Apis Biologics' um, Andrew Munn that Global Now will has that as an option where you can get rocket fueled uh, global patties. And that's awesome. But, you know, you have to buy like a pallet or two in order to be able to get that. So that's, that's quite a bit. And then with the shipping and everything, that's why I was able to get them is because I had, we sold 22,000 pounds at our conference. And since everybody was group buying with me, um, I could afford, I could justify getting them myself. And I think we got the patties for like uh, the 4% is what I got. I want to say a buck 60 something a pound with the rocket fuel. So they're, they're great. Yeah, Hilco does have some left, I think, uh, that they, they bought at the conference. They bought three pallets, but I know they were running really low. But they are a really good patty. And thanks again, Paul, for supporting us. Ted Jackson, what's going on with Appalachian Hivery? Still waiting for my boxes from Hive Life. Hey, Ted, send me an email, would you, and give me the, the uh, order amount that you are waiting on. I uh, actually talked to him yesterday um, because somebody like you was asking me what the heck's going on. And he was delivering to somebody or somebody's in North Carolina today. So I know that um, he is getting stuff done, but it doesn't seem to be at a very fast rate. Um, anyone who's having issues with that, email me and I will make sure that gets passed on immediately. Um, but... Uh, basically, they overextended themselves, and uh, it's it's led to a lot of ill feelings. 
Uh, I, I need some equipment myself. Any secrets to selling equipment on Craigslist slash Facebook marketplace? Absolutely none, because in Tennessee, it is illegal to sell um, used equipment unless there's bees in it and they've been inspected. So I have very little experience with that, and it's frustrating. Uh, sorry. Songbird Acres, waiting to do a mite treatment before supering this next week, looking highs in the upper 60s, a low 70s with lows at 40s a night. Is it warm enough for Apigard to be worth it? Great question. Apigard does really good in warmer temperatures, in my opinion. Um, I like running it even in the low 90s. Um, however, its weakness is low temperatures, and it, I don't think it will perform well for you at all. Um, that sounds like a good temperature for the Formic Pro. I actually just threw some on, and it's a little too early to tell for all the colonies that I'm testing. I, I talked to Tom Nolan at one of the conferences I was at. It was uh, Georgia. Yeah, I was down in Georgia speaking, and uh, Tommy was there, so we were uh, uh, chatting about it. And I said, well, you know, typically I don't treat until later in the year, and it's just always too hot. And he's like, well, why not treat before your flow? I'm like, well, I've thought about that. So this year I'm trying it on 30 hives. And so far from the couple that I've checked, I'm kind of liking it. But the temperatures are great. It's getting in the low 70s um, as a high. And the first couple of days are the most critical with it. Um, I will give you guys an update on that. I plan to have a video because uh, the Formic Pro is one of our options. And, and maybe we need to learn better how to use it. Um, but yeah, the Apigard does not perform well at those temperatures. It really needs, in my opinion, uh, not be getting down that low, and it needs to be getting in the the 80s. Um, it likes it hotter. Aaron, I'm interested in trying to raise queens in a backyard setup, but live in a rural area away from other apiaries. Will virgin queens mate with their own brothers? Is this detrimental to bee genetics? So actually, the queen typically flies too far to mate with the drones from her colony. However, that should be okay as far as unless you're just raising, you know, 100 queens or 50 at a time or large amounts. If you're just trying to raise five or 10, you'd be surprised what's out there even in a, um, you know, an area that you don't think that there's bees. You'd be surprised, especially if you're doing it in the prime time of the year. Um, spring, there is stuff out there more than likely unless you're just in a desert. So give it a shot. You'd be surprised how well raising your own queens could work. Now, if you were raising a bunch, I'd be concerned. But if you're just wanting to raise a few dozen, uh, I wouldn't be, be too worried about it at all. And, and give it a shot and let me know how it works for you. Cayman, have you heard of half-inch condensation holes in a solid bottom board? Oh, yeah. Um, pallets. Um different bottom boards, a drill and some holes in the bottom, um, not just for condensation, but sometimes rain. A lot of commercial beekeepers do this because when they set their uh, pallets down for pollination, of course, it's very rarely perfectly level. And even if you had it on one side to where it was angled down till the rain goes off, if it's a four-way pallet, the other side are angled the opposite direction. So pretty much as far as I know, most commercial beekeepers have holes drilled in pallets or bottom boards um, for rain or condensation. It's not a bad idea. Um, you just need to remember before you move those bees because you close up the entrance and whoops, I forgot. Now there's a cohort of them headed back your direction to let you know how much they appreciate you moving them from one location to the other. I hate moving bees. Hey, thanks for that update, Randy, on, uh, on uh, your Appalachian Hive reorder. In North Carolina and got mine from App Appalachian Hivery and got our delivery Monday night. Probably depends on your location. Well, it's good to hear that they're getting some done. He delivered mine, so I can't gripe too much. Well, yeah. Um, I know the guy. Um, good intentions and all. Um, serious miscalculation. Jake Wright. Hey, Cayman, how are your bees? They are hopping right now. We have just all kinds of pollen coming in. And when there's tons of diverse pollens like it is here in Tennessee in springtime, uh, you'd have to have a terrible queen or you'd have to have crazy high uh, pest problems to not have awesome bees right now. 
or no no sugar syrup or honey in there. So my bees are, are doing great. We baby them, though. I've been into every colony twice in the last 10 to 14 days. And so we're we're monitoring them a lot because some of them need a little bit of food. Some of them are too big. We've been pulling them back. I've made some more nukes up. We are pulling them back and equalizing uh, the yard out. There were several colonies here at my home yard that were behind. I had so many that were ahead that we have been able to plug in good frames of brood. And now this this yard is almost balanced out to where all the bees are very close in strength. And we have I've pulled several boxes of brood from here to go um, make splits or to beef up uh, colonies in other yards. So the bees are looking great. Um, I did drop some formic acid on some colonies. I'm going to try that out and see how that works for me. But man, I, I'm really excited about this year. I'm just hoping the black locust and all that stuff uh, doesn't get burned up. Hey, Chris, ECP, and thanks so much for uh, donating again. Appreciate that. Just got my first inspection from the state inspector, passed with flying collars, and now I am certified to sell nukes and queens. Pretty exciting. Thank you for years of advice and videos. Hey, thank you. And I'm actually fixing to get in, inspected myself by the our state so I can sell nukes to everybody. And we're looking forward to that. Um, it's a... Uh, it's always uh, nice to, to get flying collars on, on inspection. Um, thankfully, and this is one thing I'll say real quick, is some people say that our bees are, are weaker now than they've ever been. I actually disagree with that. I don't have European fowl brood uh, problems or chalk brood problems or anything like that. And I do raise my own queens and we keep everything in house, but I don't do antibiotics or anything like that. I honestly think the bees are stronger towards that and better performing than they were in the past. I think mites have forced only the best of the best bees to survive. They're just that egregious of a pest, um, but they're still a problem. But um, outside of mite problems, my bees typically perform really good. Um, then after that, it's queen issues and a little bit of feed, never hurt anybody. And uh, it's just a lot of fun when your bees are performing really good. And it takes a, takes a lot of work, but I find what I put into my bees, I get back out of them. And I just uh, really appreciate you supporting us again, Chris. Thank you. All right. So, Yvonne, I saw we're um, up at 738. You said uh, hello from East Bernstein, Kentucky. It was good getting to meet you. And, uh, you know, n now I know that not everybody is bad from East Bernstein, Kentucky. That's kind of been one of the butt of my jokes. Some of you guys haven't seen those videos, but I had to pick a location to pick on. Kentucky obviously was the right choice. But then I had to pick a location. And I used to deliver freight to East Bernstein, Kentucky, back when I was driving a semi truck. And uh, then Yvonne Av and uh, a couple of others uh, said, hey, wait a minute. I'm from East Bernstein, Kentucky. Careful there. Now, what can I do about roach bugs getting into my hive? My hive is a laying hive. So whatever I use to get rid of them, the bees cannot get into. Any advice? Well, this is not getting actually into your hive. It's getting between your lid and where the bees can't get to it with the inner cover. Um, uh, I would make something really thin that only a roach could get into and a little bit of roach bait and hammer them. Um, commercial guys use that a lot um, because when they go to California, California has some crazy rules. And when I mean crazy, I mean like cuckoo crazy. But if they have any weird ants or any weird roaches or anything that they don't have in California on their load, they they can literally turn a semi around and, and ship you right on out of the state. And so a lot of the commercial guys will do that kind of stuff. They'll put it to where the bees can't get it and they'll put it in between their pallets and they'll power wash in between the pallets and do all kinds of stuff to uh, make sure there are no ants or pests like that. All right. Um, Next question. I thought that was you, Chris, messaging me like, what did I do now? Lower brood box looks lower brood box looks good. Honey, couple of frames, pollen, rest is brood. Upper brood box is packed with honey. I added a honey super, but not much activity yet. Plugs, swarm, worry, no cells yet. Well, how the, the brood box looks good. Pollen. How's the brood pattern, though? Is is the queen laying hard enough to give you good patterns? Um, can you extract those frames of honey, even if there's syrup in it, extract it and get them cleared out? 
Um, sounds like you added a box. If it's comb, um, you know, she should be laying it up though. Um, or if, even if they're not, even if there's not a honey flow and they need more room for her to lay, then they should be moving that honey up into those combs. If they're combs, if it's foundation, that's a different story. But if the queen's kind of eh, then they're just not going to do much. They're just going to kind of stay where they're at and they're going to put a ton of bee bread into the colony because what happens, and this is one of the things that I, I look for when I'm evaluating queens and how good they are, especially post the honey flow or during it is okay. These other colonies are doing awesome. Why is this one always a little bit behind? And why is there so much bee bread in there? Because what happens is those colonies, they will still go after and bring all this bee bread in, but the queen's not producing enough viable brood to consume all that bee bread. And so you have a lot more bee bread in those colonies. So I don't know exactly what's going on, Scott, but um, it's something definitely to look further into. Um, a good colony is going to either swarm or it's going to be building. Oh, goodness. I am like way behind on questions. Corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. As bad as I hear a few be beaks say that it is, that's the easiest to get here. So Texas Hobo, good question, controversial one, and those are my favorite. So high fructose corn syrup has been proven to not be super awesome for bees. Um, sucrose, which is derived from, you know, refined white sugar is definitely preferred. Um, high fructose corn syrup does have some things in it um, that aren't super healthy for bees, albeit some of the most profitable, successful beekeepers I know still manage to make it work for them. Some of them are taking it and mixing it with cane sugar um, to offset some of that a little bit. And it actually makes a, quite a, a bit of a better fee because you have a balanced sucrose and fructose. Um, blend now that you've created, which is somewhat similar to what Man Lake sells. Pro Sweet is mostly a sucrose, but it has a good bit of fructose, probably from high fructose corn syrup. So if you're feeding Pro Sweet, there is some high fructose corn syrup in there, um, from what I understand. But, you know, one of the beekeepers that I know uses high fructose corn syrup and he finds that it works really good. Um, it does have some negative impacts to bees. Um, but a lot of beekeepers still find that negligible compared to not feeding at all or paying, you know, maybe twice as much for sucrose in their area. So um, I'm one of those guys that doesn't judge when it comes to that kind of stuff, because uh, literally one of my buddies who does way better than I do feeds nothing but straight high fructose corn syrup and gets it for like 21 cents a pound. It makes me very upset that I'm paying as much as I am for pro sweet. But it's like five hours from me. Yo, Cayman, we got snow right now. Uh, yo, Lambrook Farm, please keep it up there and all the frosts and everything up. Thank you. Signed, Laurel and Cayman Reynolds. Good luck um, with your bee season. <laughs> hey, Josh Hager, Mr. Bearded Bee Works. Uh, do you drop cells in immediately into your splits or do you allow them to be queenless for a period after you split? So typically what I do is I'll make my splits of a morning and then I'll drop my cells in that evening or um, at the same time um, if I use queen cell protectors. So I typically do. Um, so the queen cell protectors, I think, um, are, are worth the investment. Yeah, you pay a little bit more per queen cell, but if it saves just one queen, it pays for it, all of them. And I think that they help. Um, also, I think it helps attach them and protect them as, uh, as well. So... I definitely do queen uh, cells. One of the things, though, that I mentioned earlier is that, especially for trying to kill mites, is that we might make up our splits five days beforehand and then just come back five days later, cut down every queen cell that they're trying to raise, and then drop our queen cells in. And we create more of a brood break, which is, allows us to control mites with oxalic acid vapor and also naturally um, helps control mites a little bit too because mites don't live forever. So breaking up that cycle allows a little bit more hygienic behavior to happen. Um, it allows a break for uh, the mites as well. And then if we do oxalic acid on top of it, there's a lot of reasons um, to maybe wait just a little bit. And some people like Corey Stevens say that it's better to wait four or five days, make up your split, wait a handful of days, cut the cells down. Now they have no options to take except a queen except the one that you give them. A lot of interesting ways of doing it. 
Um, in the past, though, I just make them up in the morning and drop the cells in that night. Dave Rowden came and I have one hive I've been battling with that wants to swarm removed all the queen cells twice moving the queen to her own hive tomorrow if I find her I hope that's a fix what do you think yeah sometimes um, you just got to break them down so have you tried pulling them back so that's something that we just have to do I mean some of these big colonies we're, we're pulling two good cap frames of brood we're taking three or four shakes of bees so basically it's a small swarm um, it's you know, going to be a lot of bees it's 10,000, probably bees. Um, yeah. If you count the brood easily. So it, it's a big cutback. However, I'd rather do that and not lose a swarm um, versus uh, sending one into the trees. And, you know, we can recombine them later if we feel like it or sell it, which is what we typically do sell the nuke or make an expansion uh, colony for our yard. If we want to expand insurance colonies, all that kind of stuff, but big, good productive queens it's difficult there's a lot of techniques like checkerboarding and all kinds of different techniques but i find for the amount of work that they are i could just put a, less work into producing a nuke retard the swarming almost entirely uh, pretty much it works every time if you cut them back good enough and then i get to sell a nuke so maybe i'm not making as much honey but my i don't have to work near as hard to try to control the swarming i sell a nuke for um, as much as I would have made on the honey and um, diversifies, um, it's it's easier for me to sell a nuke than it is really for me to sell that much honey uh, the way my um, market is around here. <laughs> Lambrook Farm, keep the flatlanders out. <laughs> All right, question. I open feed dead out honey frames this time of the year northeast iowa is that a bad thing i do this not far from my bee yard but on the other side of the hedge if it's your honey i'm not too worried about it as long as it's not it wasn't some crazy disease of course you know like european fowl brood chalk brood um anything like that a lot of times my losses are from mites or queenlessness and so if I've figured out it's at the viruses and stuff like that. They're long gone at that point. If it's been all winter long and we will just uh, feed them out or better yet, if it's a solid honey frame and I'm making up a nuke um, or a split or heck, I get into a big colony like, whoa, this is a little light. Just plug one of those right on in and bam, fixed. So there's a lot of uses for that um, honey. As long as you know it's not from something that had something, uh, use it, open feed it, all that kind of stuff. Um, putting it that far away is a good idea, though, just in case of robbing. Do you incorporate green drone frames as part of pest treatment? Um, I don't anymore. I did that years ago. I was probably, it was about the time I married Laurel. So, gosh, it's been about a decade, 12 years. <laughs> um, so it's it's been a while. I think it's worthwhile if you have the time to devote to it, as long as you don't allow the drones to emerge out and create more mites i think it's great i think it it really adds up especially this time of the year the mites should be relatively low but they really love that drone brood like crazy and so removing that is going to eliminate more of them and, and killing like 50 of them now is probably like killing 500 of what would have been in September, maybe more than that. I have to do the math on it, but it, it could be really um, helpful, but you have to do all the timing and, and, and deal with that. You can either freeze the frames and then put it back in and let the bees clean it up, or you could give it to your chickens. But if they do that, you're probably not going to have much comb left. Woo. That was close. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. Well, you know, I can remember whenever there's no pressure, but somebody will like, I'll, I'll be like uh, at church or something. And someone's like, so how many years have you been married? And all of a sudden it's like, it's gone. And of course it's when she's standing right next to me. It, it's, it's, it's this thing. It's, it's weird. But if, I, if, it, if there's no pressure and she wasn't around, I'm like, oh yeah, it'll be 12 years, April 9th. And I can remember the date. Is there a reason Everyone sells and ships packages, but but none I can find offer shipping on nukes only pickup. Well, that's because it's a heck of a lot more tedious to ship nukes, and a lot of states will not allow you to ship combs into their state because it's easier to ship disease. So let's say that this package 
get shook from your, that has some European foul brood or chalk brood, a lot of that gets eliminated in a package because it can transport through food. However, the only food that that package has now is the syrup can. And so that's going to get eliminated in the bee's guts because that foul brood does not affect the adult bees, but it can be passed through the adult bees. But if you're feeding your bee sugar syrup, as soon as you get them or incoming nectars coming in, that's cleaning that out. And by the time there's brood br being raised, typically that's eliminated. And so it's a much cleaner way. And that's why it was started. Plus they're a lot less sensitive to heat. And that's a big thing. I, I would rather move bees in 40 degrees, heck 30 degrees Fahrenheit than to move them into 75 to 80 degree weather. Um, bees are hot natured and they overheat very easily. So packages are much easier to ship. Um, logistically, it's just way, 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 way better. Ooh, that tea is still hot. All right. Cayman, have you ever used OA dribble when it's in the 50s? So that's a question by William Kurtz. So this is a great question. Uh, let me find my trash can. There we go. Get that tea bag out of there. So OA dribble is underutilized. You have to be a little bit more technical with it. You don't want to get too much in there. But OA dribble is extremely cheap. You don't have to have an, a vaporizer. It actually kills better than vaporizers do because it is tackier and it lingers in the colony a lot longer than vapor will. But it is a little bit more um, hands-on. So you can, if you apply too much of it, it can be rough on the bees. Um, it's not as bad if you use the vegetable glyc glycerin. I, I think it's a great treatment. I, I used to use it all the time. I want to get back to using it a little bit more. But in the 50s is great. If it's winter time, and this is used very commonly in Europe and parts of the United States and Canada, is that when you get some broodless colonies in December, you just open them up. Okay, there's eight frames of bees. Each seam, which is the bees in between the frames, so that would be a seam, gets one milliliter or one cc of solution. Just zoop, 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 one apiece, dribble it on down, and the bees get all over themselves with that stuff and they they bump up against each other and it kills very very good making those splits in summer those smart splits with a little bit of oxalic acid dribble that's how i started doing those smart splits i would make those splits where there would be a, a brood break and i'd hit them with oxalic acid dribble and the mites would rain out but you don't want to over apply it so you can just get you a little syringe make the solution fill it up do it in the 50s perfect temperature crack that lid get someone to hold it for you if you can and just one milliliter a piece and if they're broodless it wax those mites all right golden opal i'm from australia i've just started up getting ready to go into winter i love watching you guys coming out of winter hey thanks for watching our channel that's one of the cool things about being i'm on the other side of the globe is um you can see the shenanigans that we're up to up here and before your bee season starts next year and maybe pick up a thing or two like oh i'd like to do that or maybe whoo i definitely don't want to do that and uh, and it's definitely it's fun to be able to watch uh, for me as well uh, when it's winter time here I, I definitely spend more time in winter watching youtube videos and getting to see what some of my other favorite uh, people are doing in other countries because i got to get my bee fix um, I say I want to break from my bees, and I, I for about two weeks I do, and then after two weeks I'm like, oh my goodness, I got to get into a beehive. Hey, Yasmin, thanks so much. Um, thanks for uh, watching all the way in Sweden because I know it's like 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. your time, so I appreciate you staying up late for us. And uh, for the youth program, hi, everyone. All right, so Randy Oliver, Shepherd's Hook says 5 cc per seam. Um, definitely look at Randy Oliver's stuff. He's done a lot of testing. I know that there are um, different opinions on how much dosage to use, um, but Randy would definitely know more than I would. Um, give that a check. So, Yasmin, thanks again for supporting our youth program. Um, it is awesome. We are up to 17,000 and something. I'll have to look um, for the kid program for Hive Life. So we're going to get tons of kids. 
Uh, Rossman apiaries down in Georgia just said they would donate another 2000 this year. That's going to put us up almost to $20,000. So we're going to have all kinds of kids eligible. And that'll probably be available for uh, young guys and gals to sign up sometime around um, late June, July and get those applications in. So if there's a, a young beekeeper um, that you know, we're, we're not really looking for first year uh, young men and women. It's not that you shouldn't apply because sometimes we will get them, um, but we're, we're looking for ones that we can really tell that they're, they're very, very serious about this for the long term and not just like, mm, maybe I'm going to try this and it's going to be a one-off. But anyways, um, at, Cayman, you look familiar. Uh, thanks. I usually clean up better than this. I, I haven't shaved. Um, I, I usually have my hair brushed. I just came in from working on my truck. Um, fuses are out and the air filter, all kinds of stuff up to my elbows in grease. And Laura was doing a lot of it too. Steve Gammon, we have almost two, now one to three out supposed to be it, but looks like more supposed to rain tomorrow. Okay, rain. So it won't last long. 60 Thursday, that's Maine for you. You know, I've never been up to Maine, but my dad went on a business trip and he said, you all's lobster is just whoo, crazy good. So I've got to make that trip. Um, hopefully your weather will improve. Um, I'm hoping for a couple of reasons on one of the, the guys that I watch on YouTube. Um, he was one of our uh, kid sponsors this year at Hive Life Rainier. Um, he's up there keeping bees and um, I'm hoping that you all have a great bee season. Came and I grabbed it for the first time the other day. I was going to pull those cells on Wednesday. It's supposed to start raining Tuesday and rain for four to five days. Is it okay to install those cells uncapped? Um, you can, but um, why not wait until they are? Um, just use an umbrella and and pop them in after they're capped. You can do it a little bit early, but I would I wouldn't um, I wouldn't do it. I'd let the, the the colony you already have that's doing the job finish the job and then once they're capped just be very careful and 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 surely in those four to five days um you'll get some scattered showers well there'll be a break for a little bit maybe you can find it within your time frame i don't know um, but i really prefer to let them cap them all the way and yeah, that's what i would do what book do you recommend for children could you add it to your list of recommended things so if we're talking like a beekeeping book for um, kids. Um, I just happen to have this on the table, actually. Um, this is My Unbelievable Life. This is a great, great book for just wanting to educate young children about bees. It's got some very cute pictures. It reads really good. And it, it just everything flows really good. The details, I mean, you can see that the drone cells have the bullet-shaped cells, which is accurate. Um, I've actually got a 10% off code right now because I liked it so much. I said, hey, um, can we work something out? So um, I believe it is um, Cayman 10. If you go to the site, I did a video on this one. And it's just got all kinds of details and definitely the most accurate kid book. Um, I absolutely love this one. Now, if you're wanting something that's a little bit more advanced for maybe an older kid, and you're wanting to teach them actually how to keep bees and raise bees for um, getting them into beekeeping, then Walter T. Kelly's How to Keep Bees and Sell Honey is a great book. But that's really not a kid's book. It's really more of a how to keep a beehive and, and sell honey and all that stuff. But that's a great book for adults and for young men and women who are wanting to learn how to keep bees. But as far as a book for an, to enjoy... Um, and teach kids a little bit about bees for school or library stuff. My Unbelievable Life. Fantastic book. All right. I have 32 degrees. Um, thunder and rain right now. It should turn to snow tonight. Yikes, I'll never get into the bees this spring. Ah, well, it goes that way sometimes. But I actually get into bees if I have to um, in really cold weather. Um it's just you have to be fast and don't leave the brood frames out for more than just about 30 seconds to a minute. First year beekeeper. I haven't been stung yet. Any advice when I do medication treatment, any tips? Thanks. So, um, yeah, that is a great topic. And since I'm not a medical professional, I need to give my caveat of, you know, I'm not a professional, all that jazz, man. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, most doctors also aren't beekeepers either. So, ha. Huh. Now, 
there's a lot of different reactions and things can change. I know people who have been really allergic who over time actually uh, get better. And then there's some people who have kept bees for decades with getting stung all the time, never had any issues. And after 20 or 30 years, they have a real big anaphylactic uh, reaction to stings. So there's a lot of variables. It's not a bad idea to have some epinephrine around. Um, I don't like the EpiPen though. Way too expensive. Um, there are some more affordable options out there. Um, but having some of that, that would be the only backup that I would have. A lot of people say Benadryl that actually can cause some pro problems. Um, so uh, Benadryl is not something that I recommend myself. Um, if I'm going to have something, it's epinephrine as a backup. Um, but not, not any medication. Um, as far as treatment goes, um, take this, you know, when you get stung, take the stinger out and just take your time, take a second, a bit longer, get a hive tool or a knife. And it just, if it's stung in at this angle, then take that knife and just scoop away going towards the angle to pull that out because you don't want to break it off into you because sometimes they will. And that's the gift that keeps on giving for the next couple of days. Um, one of the things that you might notice is if you get stung on the hand and you get some swelling up into your forearm, um, that's pretty normal, um, especially if you're not used to it. Now, some people won't even have that much of, of a reaction, and it depends on where you're getting stung. If you get stung in a meaty part of the arm, you might just get some, you know, a little bit of it's hot and it itches a little bit afterwards and um, that kind of thing. And so if you get it like localized swelling from, you know, here to here and here to there, that's that's not so bad. But if you're getting stung on the hand, and then your left arm swells up or your leg swells up, that's a problem. Go see a doctor. Um, or um, if you get stung in the face and you're, you, know, you have more tissue up in here, that's going to blow up a lot more. Getting stung under the fingernail is about the worst thing in the world. So um, all you can do is cry like a little baby for a little while. There's a reason why certain cultures use this location of the body for torture every nerve in the body is connected to the quick underneath the fingernail ask me how i know and uh just if you get you know if, if you get a lot of pain from a sting not just like localized pain but like pain in your chest or you, you're having a hard time breathing the first thing obviously calm down a little bit but if it if you're having a hard time breathing and pain um you know definitely that epinephrine and and call a professional um and get to a, a doctor. But, but seriously, there's a lot of people that get stung. I, I've seen this and they, they get stung on the hand and they, you know, they get some swelling up in here and it blows up a, a decent bit and they go see their doctor and they're like, Oh yeah, you're, you're deathly allergic. Don't go around bees. I used to do that when I first got into beekeeping. Uh, so did my wife. And so do a lot of people that I know. Um, I think a lot of doctors play on the side of caution. So I'm not saying be careless, but also just because your doctor sometimes says that you are deathly allergic, unless they run some tests, um, I, I found some of their answers to be highly skeptical. So I probably shouldn't say that, but um, be extra safe, all that jazz. Try the eyelid. Nope, not doing that. Um, on the inside of the nose is also quite fun. Okay, let's see here. Hey, Lyndon Johnson, thanks for supporting us again, man. I appreciate you. Hope your bee season's going good. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be on the lookout for it. Appreciate you supporting us over the years and helping us grow to what we are today. Um, we really appreciate all of you um, consistent supporters um, making this chat um, what it is. And honestly, the chat, in my opinion, is what created Hive Life because a lot of you guys um, were talking about doing some in-person meetings and eventually we caved and said okay 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 we'll do it and uh hive life was born of that and who knew but um yeah, thank you guys very much thanks london <laughs> benadryl yeah i fall asleep on you um well i don't know exactly all that's in benadryl i've i've seen the research though and it can actually encourage bigger reactions the next time from what I've seen on the research side of bee stings, it might help with that one, but it does not help your body react to it better in the future. Um, and the problem with me on Benadryl is yes. I mean, it knocks me out. I mean, if you're, if someone's trying to knock me out, um, 
you don't even bother throwing a punch. Just slip some Benadryl and a Coke or something like that, and it'll just take me out. Corey, um, we really enjoy your content as new beekeepers in Newfoundland, Canada. Started with five Apame hives. You have been a great help. Thanks. Hey, um, thank you so much for coming on, and thanks for saying that. A um, lot of good Canadian beekeepers um, that I have met. Um, we learn a lot from uh, some of the researchers and beekeepers up in Canada. Uh, you're basically our, our cousins, so we really appreciate the collaboration. And I hope that there's a lot more collaboration between Canada and the U.S. Um, I think that um, we definitely need to be working together on a lot of stuff. Um, Apame hives are great. A lot of people ask me this question. You know, if you're going to spend the money for an insulated hive, personally, I like the Apame the best. I mean, you pay a little bit more, but they are so much tougher. I've had the poly hives. I've had some other off brands of Apame. Um, they're tough. It's American, U.S. plastic. Um, everything's molded with high precision and they're very tough. And I, I like the pollen traps. If I, if I didn't have anything from Apame, the, the pollen trap is great. Um, I, I love collecting pollen and we're using that right now to get some fresh pollen to raise queens with and to, and to build these uh, guns right here. Yeah. That's a pollen fed. Brady James out of my 20 plus hives, all are taking one-to-one -one feed really quick right now. I do have a couple hives that haven't been taking any of the one-to-one. -one. They don't have much honey in the colony, but are strong. That is really odd because if all the other ones are doing it and they're not, that, that actually concerns me. Is there is the feeder plugged up? Um, they're strong, but, but why are they not taking feed? Because some people will argue with me until they're blue in the face on this. Um, I disagree strongly in this regard is the fact that bees, once they have enough food, will stop taking it. And I think that is horse nuggets. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, bees, the reason they are so good at producing honey is because they are really good at not stopping when they should. I've seen colonies produce 150 pounds for me. That's in the honey supers. That doesn't count what they have in the brood chambers. They don't need that much honey. But they, they make it anyways. And good, healthy colonies will just eat and eat and eat and eat. And the only time I will see them where they don't take sugar syrup is when there is a massive flow going on. And I think that they would take it if they had enough time to do it. But there's just so much nectar coming in during the day. And they're spending so much time at night ripening it up. I just don't think that they have uh, the manpower to handle that on those really busy days. But um, on a light nectar flow, even though there's a little bit of nectar coming in, I can get my bees to take sugar syrup. So that kind of concerns me a little bit. And a, a little bit of a further inspection um, would be warranted. They need to be taking that sugar syrup if all the rest of them are taking it. Uh, there's something going on. So Van Smith says, um, been trying to get on the channel. Am I on? So Van, you are on. You're live. You can ask questions here. Um, even throw some insults, but we'll just ban you. <laughs> Woodland Harvest Honey Company. Cayman, what's happening in the experimental yard? So um, not a lot right now, honestly. Um, last year's, though, results. Oh, gosh, that was pulled up. Um, let's see right here. Um, let's see, Chris, I'm going to go off script. Is that OK? Um, all right. So I am going to. Chris, text me or message me if this works. So we're going to try something out here. Share screen. Mm, I don't care about your tips, YouTube. Just skip. Um, let's see here. Mm, 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 mm. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do this thing. Entire screen. Ah, there we go. Perfect. All right. So now I should be sharing the entire screen. And now I'm going to go over here. Now, can anybody see this? Chris, can you see this? All right, looks good. All right. I like it when things work for me on computers. It doesn't happen very much. All right, so this is the research um, that we have from last year. Now, I need to get this in a video form. And it's a little confusing to look at. Um, but we have the APAGARD group. We have the control group, which received no treatment. Um, we have the OA vaporization group. That group received five rounds in 15 days, four grams a deep. And then um, we had all hives. So we started out with 52. 
Um, we ended up with um, less than that because they're just queen issues. Some of them were still alive, but they were too small to be uh, viable for the test. So this is a June and then our August um, and then September and um, the final day. Um, I didn't end up um, needing that. I personally, I didn't think it was necessary. Um, we had to get treatment on to keep these colonies alive. And I'll need to break this down in the video because it'll take a little bit of time. However, the Swedish sponges, um, you can see right here, there's, there's no treatment application. Um, but we came back and there was, this was like the reduction of what in September 30th after treatment was applied in August 12th, um, where things were at. So the control group, as you see right here, you know, the mite count super low. And I've got to, again, I got to break this down. I need to have time to prepare this. They've grown 829% from June to August and then from without any treatment on this. And then they went from 829% to 594% and just a massive increases. Um, ah, here we go over here. Mites per 100 bees. So there's 0.2 mites per 100 bees in June in the control group. There was 1.8 mites. Per 100 bees in the August 12th alcohol washes, and there was 12.5 mites per 100 bees in the control group September 30th. The control group, we lost almost all of them. There's only like a couple out of that group that survived, and they were pathetic and and really have no value. Honestly, they're just they're not going to be able to make a honey crop. Not worth splitting. You can see that there are some reductions. The OA vaporization actually fared best out of all these groups. And the, the Swedish sponges did pretty good. The, what I've noticed out of all these, the Apigard and the Swedish sponges definitely needed a cleanup afterwards. And so did the OA vaporization, even though we did four grams per deep and they were double deep. So that's eight grams five times in 15 days. So that's 40 grams on a double deep in 15 days. Why 15 days came in? Well, that's because you only have capped brood for about 12 odd days. And so we're just trying to hammer that window really hard. And uh, it, it did knock them back quite a bit. And the OA group survived better than any other group um, by far. The Apigard um, did well. Um, the Swedish sponges did um, as good as the Apigard did. But I was really disappointed with the performance of the Apigard. <clears throat> um, but I think what this shows, maybe more than anything, is first of all, how drastically mites grow. Now, these are commercial Italians. Um, these are um, commercial Italian bees. They're not my bees. They're not VSH from Cori or anything like that. So these things are good at raising mites. However, um, they grew so quickly from June to late September and just collapse the colonies if we weren't going to come back and clean them up. But I think what this also shows is that one treatment at the end of the year is not enough. And I've known this for a long time. I've said this for a while. A lot of other people do too, but multiple treatments are important because it's very rare that a treatment is going to get you that 95 plus percentage kill, which is what you need and you're not getting it. So don't count on it. And that's why I treat twice in summer late june typically and again in early september or late august some people call it excessive i find it very profitable and then i treat again in winter time i need to do a specific video going into more detail on this but that was last year's experimental yard um data right there um there's there's a little bit more to it than that that's like the basics of it uh, okay stop sharing and how do i go back to my page oh there we are <clears throat> Yeah, OAV for the win. But <clears throat> one thing that I forgot to mention, the brood was hammered. It, I thought I was going to lose my queens in that group. 40 grams. Now, granted, we use the um, instant VAP vaporizer, which personally I think performs much better than any of the other vaporizers because it's insulated and it works so fast. You have less oxalic acid degradation. Um, but let me tell you, Doing that in August with a respirator and a full bee suit on with big, strong colonies, that sucked a lot. And that was over just like 13 colonies. I can't imagine doing that over an operation. It would be a nightmare. 
but it did perform really good. But the brood was shotgun patterns for almost two brood cycles. And then after that, it picked back up. I thought I was going to lose my queens. I'm like, I've ruined the queens. Um, but the, it did. they did perform better than any other group. However, all of that work, what if we had to just, and this is something that I would like to try, is what if we had to just made them broodless for a little bit and then hammered them with uh, that? Anyways, um, back to questions and answers. <laughs> uh, Byron, you're hilarious. Cayman, how would you transport queen cells if you don't have a portable incubator? Thanks. Um, I would try not to travel too far. And what I would do is if you have some way of getting something close to the correct temperature, the cells can withstand a little bit of fluctuation, um, but not a ton. So what you can do, um, if you read GM Doolittle's um, books from 100 years ago, um, which he's the, the father of modern day grafting, and I love GM Doolittle's books. And you have to enjoy to read to uh, to read his book. So it's, it's written in old fashioned style. You know, of course, all the young people think that we're so much smarter nowadays than we were a hundred years ago. Uh, you read those books from a hundred years ago. They were very educated. Um, however, um, he would take a brick or a stone and he would warm that up and then wrap it in a towel. And then when he would take his cells to his out yard, um, that would keep them warm. Obviously that brick can't be 200 degrees. Um, so maybe you have a way of like warming a stone overnight, maybe in an oven at 100 degrees, which isn't too far off the mark and keep them to the other side of the box and just kind of keep it close. Because when the cells are around 10 days old, they can get a little bit cooler and be OK. Um, but personally, I just rather uh, you can rig up your own incubator, literally get a light bulb, go on Amazon, get a thermostat. Put it inside, you know, get it to where you can you know, plug it in and with an inverter to your car. Of course, this costs time and money. Might as well get an incubator, basically. But you can make your own and, and regulate that temperature um, in that that way. I have an extra strong double deep hive and, and a split that just got its second deep. Can I equalize by swapping locations or will large numbers of returning foragers kill the queen in the split? Typically, Steve, when there's pollen or a nectar flow going on, they're pretty good about not killing the queen. However, if you do that during robbing season, um, it's just bees are a lot more chippy. They're stressed out. It's just a totally different time of the year. Um, however, instead of swapping locations, which I do that this time of the year, so you can totally do it. You could just go into your big colony and pull a good frame of capped emerging brood or two and, and introduce the brood that way, which would be safer um, and probably less work because you're not having to move your hives. And that'll give them an instant boost of young bees, which are more valuable, in my opinion, uh, than forager bees because they have a, their whole life of ahead of them. And you can shake frames of nurse bees in there, too. Just make sure that you don't get your queen in there from that other colony. But there's several different ways to approach this and swapping hives. Um, locations is one of them Cayman, have you ever used oa dribble when it's in the 50s i've already hit that question chris or maybe we we actually maybe you had it in, in the, the the lineup and um all that stuff hey randy thanks for coming on we'll see you later appreciate you um, so, um, I'm looking for the update, updated wax numbers for the company you purchased dipping wax from. Do you have them? Mm. Updated wax numbers. So the company that I got my wax dipping stuff from was candlemaking.com. It's in Na Nashville. It's also called Aztec. I don't know why they call it. I have two different names. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for it. It's confusing. Um, but just go to candlemaking.com. Um, and then it's also, um, Aztec. And if you call them, uh, well, actually, I don't think they do ever since COVID. A lot of people don't, um, offer the same customer service they used to. It really sucks. Um, I should stop using that term. It stinks. And, uh, you can send them an email, but uh, they, they do have the wax that you need. Gulf University on YouTube did a perfect video of queen cell transport involved a hot water bottle in a box with a set amount of inches of sawdust. I haven't seen that one, Sinister Hippo, but that sounds um, awesome, like a great idea. Just make sure that you have those cells well protected um, to where they can't get knocked around or anything drop on them. 
Um, but you can literally drill holes in a wooden block, block. And so what a lot of guys will do is they'll get a um, thick piece of wood and then they will drill the right size holes in it. And then they'll, the Jay-Z, BZ or whatever cup that you're using is too big, but the cell can fit down and they just sit there. And that kind of protects them from, from anything until you're ready to pull them on out. I'm much more smarter now than I was 100 years ago. Jed, you don't know what you're talking about. You're you're not even 30 yet, are you? Just what you need to focus on is building uh, more wax dipping tanks and extractors and and, and talk less. That, that'd probably be good. You know, uh, let let the old people speak. <laughs> uh, please help. I'm fighting a major battle with high beetles, 20 per frame and two deeps using vinegar and vegetable oil with Swiffer pads. Is there something else you can recommend? Ooh, okay. Well. Vinegar, I don't know if vinegar works that well. I've heard that beer works really good, um, you know, especially with the, the, the male hive beetles. They, they just love that stuff. Um, that's a joke. Um, as far as a lure goes, if you have some of the, the traps, you can... I think I've got some around here. I've got too much bee equipment. Hey, that's where that went. I've got some around here, but, uh, oh, there it is. Paperwork, paperwork. Um, so this is some that I got from Rossman. And uh, it opens up, and you can pour some oil in there. But what I like to do is small hive beetles absolutely love pollen patties. They love it. And you stick a little bit of pollen patty down in there, and not to where they can climb out, though. So don't make it too high. And they will hunt that down. And you can put those in the top box and one on each side. And that helps quite a bit. Um, some people use illegal substances um, for that. I really prefer not to speak of that. But a lot of commercial guys are using uh, baits that um, are not recommended or legal to use in a hive to eliminate those. But this is what I would recommend right here. Um, that, and you're basically doing everything else. Uh, there's a couple other options out there, but that's basically all I use. Hell Hive tonight, last chance to get your Hive Life Conference videos at the discounted price. Just ordered mine. Ah, is that tonight? Yeah, I guess it is. It's 331. Yeah, and we sent a video code to everyone who attended Hive Life uh, to get them half off, and they turned out really swell. And if you haven't gone to um, our website, even if you don't want to get the videos, you can see the trailer from Hive Life. And uh, the, the guys did a really good job on, on getting a, a short little video on what hive life looked like. And um, thanks for getting those um, hell hives and for coming and for supporting us as much as you have. I got some of your honey over here. The kids and I have been munching on it. We, we kind of rotate through all the different honeys people have given us. And, um, of course, my son, Jimmy, he's like Mikey. He'll eat anything. Every honey is just the best. Um, but uh, he, he, he loves all you all's honey. And I do as well. So the beetle blaster bottom board, um, that is an option. Um, it doesn't get rid of all of the beetles. Um, I've, I have a couple. Um, however, it does help. The biggest problem that I have with mine is that the holes that the beetles go through, they my bees will propolize them up, and then I have to get that baseboard off eventually and unplug those uh, to get that to work. But um, a little diatomaceous earth underneath there does a good job. Um, something that, um, hmm... Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different ways to do it, but uh, small high beetles are a huge pain in the butt. We need a better product, and one of the universities in Georgia is working on it, but I, I just don't know if it'll ever see the light of day. Their uh, EPA is such a pain. All right, more questions, more questions. Cayman, have you ever done Nozema spore counts? I have not, Mike. Something I really want to do, and we want to get to it um, this year, but... We just have too many things going on, you know, uh, too many things. I'm actually interviewing a guy this um, week for some part-time bee help and maybe future uh, full-time one day. And uh, I could really, really benefit from that. So I can get them to do, you know, basic stuff like Laurel and I go around and mow the bee yards. And, you know, we have to do you know a lot of stuff that somebody else could do. If we could get them to do the, you know, the, 
mundane stuff that allows us to focus a lot more on the the cool stuff for the YouTube channel and for just our knowledge and learning for us and sharing that with you guys. Beatles prefer Budweiser. I wouldn't know, <laughs> but um, if I'm if I was going to buy a beer and I've yet to ever buy one, um, I'm going to go for the cheap stuff. Beatles aren't worth worth anything expensive. So Pappy's Bees, you mentioned banana in a beetle trap once seemed to work really well. So it did perform better than just regular oil. It did. However, um, I also tried another type of fruit in there. I want to say it was peaches. Um, it was canned peaches, yes, and it did not work super good. Um, I thought the banana performed better. Um, but then when we put the pollen patty in there, it was better than both of those put together. Very mm -hmm. good. I have um, no idea, Lambrook Farm. I don't know anything about uh, what makes a good microscope or not. Gotcha. So one of the things that we are working on right now in our who put Captain Chris, did you put Cayman Reynolds Captain America? Gee, um, I, I, I need to hit the serum that uh, Steve Rogers hit before that could be uh, the case. But uh, thanks, I suppose. Uh, he is my favorite. If I had to pick a Marvel hero to be, that's that's the one I would go for. Um, very much like the America thing. Um, however, so what we're doing right now. Is, is we are going into all of our colonies and we are just pulling them back, pulling them back. There are some people, and I used to be one of these people, who are doing a lot of checkerboarding and various different things, but I, I never have had near as good success doing that as pulling the bees back. And so why would I do that? And what am I looking for? So if we're getting into a double deep colony and there's like eight frames of brood. And I know that my honey flow is not going to start for about another week, but it doesn't matter. It's still too big. There's certain conditions that make the bees want to swarm. First of all, just being large and having lots of nutrition um, coming in is another factor. An older queen can be part of the factor because they don't produce as good a pheromone as the younger queens. So therefore, they don't keep the colony kind of glued together better. And so there's a lot of different factors that go into swarming. And once there's a big population, they get plugged up. It's natural. They were designed to be this way because they don't reproduce like mammals do. So they have to have a trigger to make them reproduce. So obviously the species can survive. And it's important, especially for honeybees to reproduce um, often because they are so short lived, you know, a queen can typically only last in the South a year or two. And so there's not a lot of opportunities there um, for her to get that done in her lifetime. And bees obviously don't even live um, close to, um, you know, more than five, six, seven weeks, you know, somewhere in that range, depending on the nutrition. So there's a very short window there. And then nutrition obviously is not available in most locations throughout the entire year. So spring is the best time for bees to reproduce. So there has to be those tendencies to make more bees or else we would have none. So as beekeepers, we have to recognize this and the colonies that are best at swarming typically are the ones who are really good bees. At some point, we don't want the ones that are excessively swarmy, um, but a good colony is going to make a swarm or two. And so we got to realize that's part of the game. And so I pull my bees back and we, this is how we make up nukes to sell. This is how we make up backup colonies. If you want to have five honey production colonies, have three nucleus colonies as backup. You're going to lose Queens. You're going to lose a swarm. Occasionally we never have, I've never had a year where I haven't lost a swarm ever that I know of, unless it was maybe a year where I, I lost all my bees. <laughs> um, that was not a good year. Um, but, um, you know, you just, you got to pull those bees back a little bit. So if there's eight frames of brood in there. I'm probably going to cut them back to five frames of brood Four, and if it's maybe four frames of brood, if it's like just bricks, 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 and I have extra combs. So I drop those in there, open up the brood nest. Now I'm not dropping empty drawn combs or foundations in between the brood. That's a good way to really disrupt a colony. It's still getting cool at, at night and I don't want to do that. I really don't like doing that ever. So we're, we're putting the brood down in the bottom deep. If there's like four frames of brood. And then if we're going to put any open combs in the bottom, empty combs, we're going to put them close to the wall because they can still move stuff out of the queen's way. They can move 
honey. They can move sugar syrup. They can move that into those combs and clear that space. Or instead of putting bee bread in the center, they can put it towards the edge now in those combs. And then we're going to leave room up above and and they can they can push different resources and the queen can go up there and and lay a lot a lot depends on your weather i mean if you're getting highs at 29 degrees fahrenheit you're not going to be rotating your boxes and, and doing things there's there's, there's got to be a balance to it and so this is it's really hard to teach this with youtube because my videos can help to a degree but it can't look at your weather forecast it can't tell you when your flows are starting to happen it can't show you exactly what to do with this specific hive so some of this is trial and error we try to help you with the basic fundamentals but this more tedious stuff is going to have to be something you're going to have to dial in and learn for yourself but that's what we're doing this time of the year some of the colonies need to be fed some of them need pulled back some of them need a boost some of them need a new queen and i found one like that the other day that was laying half drones and half queens and messing up all kinds of my combs with all kinds of drone brood and i was not very happy um, off with her head and a new queen's in there and i expect that to look much much better is there a coupon code for hive life 2024 in january so there is there's no coupon codes for going to the conference now there was a coupon code for people that attended hive life 2023 to get the videos um, for half off um, but that's it um, any tips for fixing comb that has been drawn out too far. So Ryland, uh, thank you for supporting us again and a great question. So a lot of times if the comb's like dry and thin, like if it's new comb and it's still very thin and not brown and, and gummy, like they get over time, a lot of times you can just take your hive tool and just kind of rake it down a little bit. And But if your combs are a little bit older and, and harder, you can't really do that without damaging the comb, but you can get like a hot knife um, you can heat up some water to you know, really like boiling, boiling temperature, get a knife in there and just take that and just shave that along the um, bars. Now, if this is something that's in the hive already that has resources in it, well, that makes it a little bit more fun. Now, doesn't it? You can still take a hot knife to it. But you'll have to shake all the bees off. And, um, and that, that just makes it a lot of fun, doesn't it? Uh, the best thing to do is never let it get like that, but things happen. And a lot of times if it's like honey up top, because that's typically what it is, they won't raise drone worker brood deep like that because they, they don't need it that deep. And the brood stays a certain size, but up towards the top, it's the honey layer that gets drawn out really deep and they'll make them really fat so they can fit more honey in it. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll shake all the bees off. And then if I have a frame feeder in the hive, or something like that, I will literally put that over the frame feeder and I will crush those combs flat and drain the majority of the honey down into that frame feeder and level that out. And then, yeah, there'll be a little bit dripping down below, but if it's a strong colony, it won't be an issue. They'll clean that up and go, what the heck happened here? Um, but that's basically how I would deal with in all those situations. Cayman, have you seen any nectar coming in around your yards? I don't see any here yet in Dandridge. So tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Um, it's not even enough to maintain a, a powerful colony. So we have to be watchful of that. However, the autumn olive is starting to bloom. I mean, it's just now starting. So I, I expect with some of these days we're going to get some sun. We are going to have some good nectar come in, hopefully. And so it, it could be happening very soon. It's just, just amazing. It just bam there it is and then then when it shuts off it's just it's just that fast too it's that's why we are so addicted to this <laughs> it's it's just crazy stuff but no not a lot of nectar yet steve can you use canning wax for putting on frames um heard you don't want it to use other people's beeswax because it could cause disease thinking it would be clean because uh, canning food, what do you think, Cayman? Uh, bees won't draw that out, um, unfortunately, um, or maybe fortunately, you know, it's paraffin and stuff like that, so it's petroleum. Um, the Chinese have gotten caught several times when companies decide to go cheap and they get stuff from Hong Kong. They often find that the wax, the beeswax, is mixed with paraffins because they like to make a couple extra um, bucks. So 
but the bees do not draw it good. And we have had some companies here in the U S who have done that. And they've made a few commercial beekeepers and myself a little bit cranky. Um, I only buy from guys that I know are doing it in the U S and, and one of the, the new companies that, um, I'm liking that does a good job is, as mother load, um, for the plastic frames, they get great capping wax on there. Um, of course I use all their frame feeders too. So I just get all at once, but you can't use any of those paraffins or any canning wax like that. Now you can heat beeswax enough to kill those diseases though. Um, so if you just, you know, heat it up pretty good, it's going to kill those diseases and you don't have to worry about that. So just get some beeswax. Um, if, if you're buying a block of it from somebody, um, as long as it's been, you know, clean and all that kind of stuff, then yeah, roll that stuff on, give them a good layer of it and they'll draw that out really good. Do you put nuke boxes above your hives for swarms? Um, no, I don't because uh, swarms typically do not stay in the same yard. I've, I've never seen that before. Um, they, they go off and they typically do not, um, they will rest nearby. So they might rest in your swarm box, but, um, typically a colony swarms and then it rests, it collects itself somewhere relatively close. And then it could be a couple days. It could be within 20 minutes. It takes off to a, a de destination somewhere off in the wild blue yonder. It could be several distances, but I've, I don't think that swarms light down in, per, in, in close proximity at all or very very rarely um, i've never seen that they they typically go a good ways away and i think that's that's probably good for the species to do that to get away and diversify um the location and resources how long do you recommend leaving a small open and in entrance reducer on a new package my packages were only just installed yesterday but the entrance today was completely clogged with bees so if there's maybe a few dead bees from the package, because there's always a few dead bees um, in, in packages because you're losing bees every day. I mean, bees just die all the time. If your queen's laying 1,500 eggs a day, eventually you're going to have 1,500 bees dying every day. You don't really see this if you're around grass, but if you're around concrete and you just see all the dead bee bodies all over the place, it's like, oh, my goodness, this is this is crazy. Ten, Just think about that. Ten days. 15,000 dead bees during peak season, somewhere around that. Wow, that's a lot. Bees are kind of designed to be, designed to be a little expendable. Um, that's the way they roll. But as far as your entrance reduce request, re question, gosh, um, once they get around eight frames strong, you want to do two things, in my opinion. First of all, once they start drawing that eighth frame, you want to take that frame they're partially drawing and a frame of eggs or just a frame of eggs and pull that up and have your second brood chamber on because you don't want to wait till they're nine frames or 10 frames because they get a little compact in there. They're going to think about swarming and they'll do it at that size. So once they start working on that eighth frame, pull up a frame of eggs or larvae up into the next deep box of foundation so they can start working on that and keep in expansion mode. And then at that point, that is when I would open up that entrance a good bit. And um, I see a lot of pictures on Facebook. And these people have two deep boxes strong of bees in an entrance that big, about a quarter inch tall. Those bees can't hardly ventilate. And you know, some people think that they're swarming. They're just bearding because bees are around 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And the brood has to be kept way cooler than that. And so you know, they have to get those bodies out just to maintain the uh, the colony. Now, if you have a screen bottom board, different situation, but um, definitely open it up a lot more. Um, typically six inches is what I'd have it open. And it's easy. You can open it up in springtime. There's not really an issue with robbing. Once you get into summer, you might consider a robbing screen or the best thing to do is just keep your colony strong and healthy because strong, healthy colonies, they're the ones doing the robbing, typically not getting robbed. Can I use can I use mixed fermented syrup with fresh syrup like mixing 50 gallons to 50 to 500 gallons of new syrup? Um, that's an interesting question. And honestly, um, I've wondered that myself and have done a little bit of that. So if it's not fermented too much, like it's just a little funky, 
I would totally use it. Put a little bit of something in there. That's why I keep a little bit of uh, product around, typically like Hive Alive, because uh, the thymol is good um, for that kind of thing. Um, if I'm going to use something like that, thymol is what I'm going for. And so put that in there. It should neutralize um, what's in there, or at least a lot of it. And then, yeah, mixing it, a ratio of like 10 uh, to 1 good stuff would be best. Uh, some people would say it's ill-advised. But if you know if it's like really bad, like it's alcohol level, um, I would go, eh, no way. But if it's just a little bit moldy and funky, yeah, I'm going to use that. Rachel, have you tried Saracel feeders? If so, how do you like them? So I have a little bit, and I've tried other feeders that are similar. They, um, they're, they're a good feeder. I don't like top feeders. It's not because they're bad for bees, um, but that's one more piece of equipment that I have to buy. It's, um, it's going to be in my way. Uh, you know, and if you're, if you're running three or four hives or five hives or even 10, that's not such a big deal, but we run hundreds. And so... Sarah cell feeders don't make a lot of sense for us because they're on 40 bucks, I think, 30 something, 40 bucks. So times that by 100 hives, it's, it's quite a bit of money. Um, and also every time I get into the hive, I have to pull that off. So I, I don't like that um, very much, but they do work. And there's a lot of fans of Sarah cell feeders um, that like them quite a bit. So um, I think uh, there's a lot of pros to that. The, the biggest issue with me is the expense and also that I have to pull it off every time, but they work really good. And, um, so if that's the type of fear you want, Saracel would be a good one. Have you used Hivegate in any of your hives thoughts? So I'm, let me type this in real quick. Hive gate. I'm pretty sure I know what you're talking about, but I'm just going to reconfirm. And, uh, let's see here. Okay, yeah, better be Hivegate single entrance. Oh, yeah, I saw those things. Um, they were circulating for a while about how much better they were supposed to be and all that stuff. I, I'm, I'm, I think it's ridiculous, um, personally. Um, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but um, maybe it says it can help with yellow jackets, robbing bees, Asian hornets, all that kind of stuff. I just don't need that extra equipment. Um, my bees do great. Uh, I've overwintered without any of that fancy stuff. The best thing to have for success is healthy bees. Great queen, low pests, plenty of nutrition. You don't need any of the extra bells and whistles. Um, I just don't see a lot of sense in having that. If I'm going to invest in something to help my colonies through winter to, for temperature as well, um, then I'm going to go with something like an insulated lid. Um, and as far as protecting from pests, you can make your own um, entrance um, robber screens and stuff like that. But I don't know. To me, for 16 bucks, and, and it's just so small of an entrance. My colonies in August, I was having to split them because they were so strong. They'd never be able to use an entrance that small. There's a lot of things like that. I've seen some people making entrances out of PEX plastic. And it's like, well, small hive beetles and, and pests can't get into here. Well, your bees can't hardly get out of there. And when I've got a double deep of bees, they're going to, they're going to abscond if I don't have more ventilation. So if you combine it with a screen bottom board, maybe that could work. But um, I just don't see a lot of sense in, in some of these things. That's just me personally, though. Cayman, have you done a Damari split? What are your thoughts on this? I have not. I actually was asked that in the last live chat, and I think the one before that, and uh, it's no problem, but I've never tried it. Um, I don't, um, I don't see it. I would like to have the time to try these things. I really would, but it seems really intense. And what I'm doing right now is before the colonies get to the point of swarming, I cut them back. They already feel like they've swarmed. And my colonies should be hitting peak right after the honey flow starts just about right when it starts somewhere in there so i might lose a little bit of my early honey flow but tiny bit not much but then they hit the stimuli of long-term storage if i can just get them past that first little bit there and i have enough combs um, i don't have to do anything like that that's just too labor intensive for a bunch of hives in my opinion and um, so I, i've just never given it a shot I know several really good beekeepers who employ that though. So I'm not knocking it. I just, doesn't make sense for me. Haven't tried it. 
I need comb. Thought it would help me to put a jar of one to one or less in front of the hives to boost combs. Yes, my bees doing great now. Just need to build comb. So um, you put it in front of the hives. Um, is there any reason you're not like putting it in the hives or, or like direct feeding um, or anything like that? Uh, maybe a, a, you're talking about a Boardman feeder, entrance feeder, and that kind of in front of the hives. Um, you know, they'll, they'll take it a lot faster. Um, if you, if you put it like that, but definitely feeding can be very helpful. And if your colonies don't need a lot of weight, let's, let's, let's say you get to a point in the season where your, your bees are drawing comb, but you're looking like, oh man, they got a lot of food or they're getting close to having too much food. But I still want them to keep drawing. You don't have to feed one to one. Why not feed half a pound of sugar to one pound of water? Nectar's thinner than one to one by a good deal. So you're not going to hurt the bees. They just won't put on poundage very quick. But um, we'll be doing some pretty cool videos on drawing comb this year. And that's my plan anyways. And we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> Cayman Reynolds, I got a question from a new beekeeper of using egg yolk and hemp seed powder. 50% protein powdered sugar mix for building the hives in spring. I have no knowledge here, have you? So there are some recipes that do use um, part of the egg and do use different types of powder. I'm not familiar with hemp seed a powder being used. Um, there's a lot of other things that I've seen. You can make stuff. I mean, a typical pollen patty, like the commercial types, are mostly soy and corn um, and various things like that. Um, there's also some other types of uh, peas and different things and uh, powders that they can use for protein, a uh, brewer's yeast, different things. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. I really have never tried to custom make one and I would really not be the best person. Randy Oliver on scientificbeekeeping.com, his website has some information on some of the trials that he's run where he's made a uh, Dave uh, Hackenberg's um, recipe. And there's a little bit more information on some custom mixes. Maybe that would be a place to get some ideas. Entrance feeder. Okay, good deal, Robin Hood. Terry Richard, I got a sweet deal on three-quarter inch plywood, 20 bucks a sheet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Made approximately 175 bottoms and 175 tops starting dipping today. Did it just like you said, 250 to 300 degrees for 15 minutes. I think it's a great start. Hey, man, um, glad to hear um, wax dipping is awesome i love it once you once you wax dip i just I just can't go back at least i can't i love it um it just does such a great job everything that i've wax dipped still looks great i have literally entrance reducers that i wax dipped and they're spruce which stinks at being rot resistant and i found one that has been buried in the dirt for a couple years perfectly fine i mean it was it was three quarters buried in mud it's been there at least two years Perfectly fine. Love that. And uh, if it was painted, that thing would be dirt by now or well on its way. 840 bucks for 42 sheets. What a break in price, man. That is that is nice. Um, the thing of it is, though, Terry, you didn't share with the rest of us. And now I feel like you're 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 being a little selfish and, uh, you know, a little bit of a braggart, too. So, you know. Chill, chill just a little bit, Terry. We're feeling a little jealous over here. No, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that for you. Hey, Jeremy Lindsay, um, thanks for coming on. 3 a.m., man. Got to get up early. Um, good luck. We'll talk to you later, Jeremy. So Terry Hagen says, how is your long hive doing? Um, it survived yet again. So every year that I've had that long hive, it has survived. Produced 100 pounds out of it last year. The year before, I produced around a five-gallon bucket. And they survived again this year. They were a little bit smaller than I liked them to be. They're only about a five frame nuke coming out of winter, which was still viable. Um, I typically would like it a little bit bigger than that, but I didn't really baby them as much in the fall hive life. Um, I'm going to blame that all year long. Um, however, yeah, they look good. They're building up good right now. It's about 12 to 14 frames strong. So it's looking good and I expect it to do quite well, but I requeened it. I've requeened it every single year. And I've treated it every single year and I've done alcohol washes on it every single year and shown videos of that and using Apigard and oxalic acid to control the mites and great queens dead mites. Good nutrition seems to keep working.
And uh, funny thing is anybody can do it. No snake oils, no special equipment. All right. Thanks for reminding on the Hive Life video. Just got it. Uh, thanks, Michael, for supporting us. The videos turned out really good. Um, I, I was really pleased with the camera guys. They, they did a great job. And uh, it's nice because I wasn't able to hear any of them. And then um, a lot, of course, not everybody could go. You can't go to every single one of them as well. And so we got a lot of work that we're, we're doing with Hive Life. And that's who keeps us busy. Hive Life is a, a year-round thing to a certain degree on, on different chores that we've got to accomplish and improvements we want to create. But we're starting to get a good team around us. And I'm very, very thankful for several of those people. We just have a great community. So many good people. Um, I, I feel bad because there's so many good people that I, I can't, I don't have the time for. And it, it kind of really hurts me a lot because, um, you know, some of them message me and it, it takes me days now to get back to some of these people. And some people I just can't get back to anymore. I can't answer as many questions on YouTube or Facebook, but we are just slammed all the time and so I'm, I'm hoping as we get some employees we will be able to get a little bit more personable and and get better videos and all the good things we want more 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 all the time just like honeybees just a little bit more honey what's gonna hurt how long do you keep your pollen traps on during a strong pollen flow so i typically do just mine one day on one day off i don't like leaving my pollen in there for more than one day so um, but I'll, I leave them on and with the Appa May one, I just smoke the bees up after I take the tray out, pull it out, um, come back, do it again. But if I run 20 hives like that, you know, just, um, I, I get a lot of pollen really quick. I have to admit, I've never tried two days on and two days off. And what you could do is obviously I'd still come back every day. I haven't tried this. On um, the two days, I assume, though, those people are still coming back every day and collecting the pollen and at in the evening and then still leaving it on for that second day. And so you're not having to do quite as much work um, with turning it on and off. But I wouldn't do anything more than that. Um, but I will be collecting pollen. Um, I collect pollen late March, April and May. And, and that's when I collect pollen. We could probably do a little bit in the fall. But uh, I really don't like doing it. And most years, it's kind of sketchy on the fall flow. And I want my bees to build up really good for that winter cluster. I just want to say thanks to Vanderpool Farms. Um, appreciate you, Harry. I saw that email that you sent me with the uh, the bluegrass. Um, uh, not the bluegrass, the, the, the song recommendation. And I, I appreciate it. I did listen to it. I just haven't emailed you back. But I do appreciate that quite a bit. And uh, thanks for letting people know to hit the thumbs up. Little things help out quite a bit. Thumbs up, subscribing, uh, commenting on our videos, sharing our videos to your local bee nuts with, you know, that all those things help us out tremendously. And thanks, everybody, for what you do. Terry Rich, well, I understand that. I won't tell you much about my wax dipping tank. I don't think you like it much. I can only dip 40 bottoms or tops and or eight deeps at a time. Ter Terry? Ah, you, you're killing me, man. <laughs> that sounds awesome, though. Sounds really good. Uh, wax dipping is awesome. Came in one of my hives swarmed yesterday, but I don't see many drones. I'm in Indianapolis. Thanks. So a lot of times, a lot of the drones do leave with the swarms, and some of them do stay, and it doesn't really matter. Um, there, So, and I don't know if this is related to your question, but there are have been a youtuber who's pretty popular um who has said that when you have a lot of drones that means your hives fixing to swarm and i think that's um horse nuggets um you can have a lot of drones when your bees swarm but just seeing a lot of drones does not mean that your bees are going to swarm um now as far as if you're concerned about the queen mating or like so the bees that you have left those queen cells emerging and that virgin queen getting mated i think as long as you have good flying days, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, it doesn't take that many drones, and I guarantee you there's at least uh, 30 to 40 good drones out there right now for that one uh, queen going to be leaving that. So uh, the main thing now is flying weather. Is that queen going to have some good warm days and some non-rainy days to get that mating flight in? But, um, you know, if they swarmed out this early, that's uh, that's quite interesting. Um but we're definitely getting swarms down here in Tennessee and parts of Kentucky. 
Randy says, um, this is the Randy, the dirt rooster listening in on the drive home. Hope everyone has had a great weekend. Well, good to hear from you, Randy. So I got an interesting story. Randy, Randy just uh, gave me a hard time the other day. It wasn't very nice of him at all. Um, but you know, Randy's just, he's, he's bigger than me and he just picks on me all the time. Um, but anyhow, so I was down at Rossman uh, filming that and I can't wait to share that video with you guys as we get that edited. Um, and I was over there looking at their observation hive and Alan um, with Rossman, uh, a guy came up to him. This is my first year and um, I've been watching some YouTube videos. Randy McCaffrey, uh, the Dirt Rooster channel. Yeah, I watch all his videos. He's the one that got me into beekeeping. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Another crazy person. And uh, sure enough, um, Alan just grins. He's like, well, have you ever heard of another YouTuber named Cayman Reynolds? And the guy's like, no, I don't think I've heard of that guy before. And he's like, well, he's right behind you. And so he turns around. It's like, well, maybe I have seen that guy before. Yeah, I think he was catching a swarm up on a Subaru. And then he hopped down. I'm like, I have a Subaru and I know how short those things are. That guy must not be very tall. And of course, Alan just had a great time of that. And then he proceeded to call Randy unbeknownst to me and then randy calls me and just gives me all kinds of heck over it so it's not fair picking on the little guy but you know whatever uh <laughs> it was hilarious it was hilarious and randy got me good but you know uh, first time you know, sh shame on you second time shame on me ain't gonna happen twice Without you sharing your video and telling me how to dip, it wouldn't have been possible for me. Really appreciate you. No problem, Terry. We we want to help beekeepers out, and we want you to keep your equipment from rotting. We want you to enjoy this equipment 15 years from now. And, um, I, you know, I, I've talked to some of the folks that run some of these bee companies, especially some of the bigger ones. They're really interested in us having to buy equipment every four to five years. Um, I don't like that very much. To do it, and they're charging us an arm and a leg for it. Um, so anything that we can do um, for our bee community to help each other. And it was another beekeeper that taught me. And it was a, an older beekeeper, a guy who's like 70-something, that taught him how to do it. So that's that's how we really bring wealth into our industry and save money. Um, I'm glad that it's working good for you, Terry. Keep me posted on that. And, heck, send me a picture if you get a chance. Send, send, email it to me. I always would like to learn from your setup and see what you've done. Mine was really basic. All right, there was a question. Um, oh, goodness, where was it? It just jumped around. Cayman Reynolds, who isn't bigger than you, Jonathan Bennett? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right, Jonathan. Um, boy, there was a question I saw. And I was, oh, there it was. Uh, Drew Jober. I got some nice chapstick labels ordered from Beresford uh, labels. I told Phoebe to show you them if you're interested. Um, I would love to see those. I actually... Speaking of which, got my labels in from them, and let's see if I can find one. And oh, here it is, right here. So, um, I don't know how well you can see that. They're they're like glossy gold, and you can't see the details too good. I'll have to just take a picture and put it on a, a video or something or Facebook. But there's all kinds of flowers and bees in here. You know, our state of Tennessee um, gold label. And all that kind of stuff, and we're gonna we're gonna do a couple more things. Uh, Phoebe is great to work with on these, and um, they were at our conference. But it's Barris uh, Ford Company, and um, I'll, I'll leave a link for them. I'll do a little YouTube video on them. They they do a great job, and um, I like to be able to get what I want. And, and some of the, the beekeeping companies, um, the bigger ones, they don't really give us a lot of options. So they, I really like the gold foil look to me. Um, yeah, I just call her on the phone and like, hey, this is what I like adjusted and boom. I like customer service. It is still in style. Do, 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 do. Teresa Jones says, I paint all my boxes and lose very few due to rot. And if you paint them really good, that is true. You can paint them really good. Problem is uh, a lot of people aren't painting them quite right. And but if you paint your boxes really well, you can get a lot of time and, and come back every so often and, and give them a little bit of a dress up paint, too. So paint does work. It just takes, um, in my opinion, a lot more effort to get that because, I mean, it takes you have to do a good job to seal your box as well with paint. And um, you got to make sure everything's covered just right and all the gaps are done. But if you it can be done, it has been done for 
very long time, but I'm too lazy, Teresa. I like to just drop it in that vat of wax. 15 minutes later, uh, that box is sealed, sealed. And I like the wood look, and I hate painting with a passion. All right. Cayman, how many days of good weather does a queen be need to mate well? Well, if... If all of them, like you have 10 queens going out at the same time and it's a perfect world and she flies out that day and it's sunny, she might be able to take care of business in just a couple days. Um, the problem is, is, you know, weather sometimes aligns that good and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's really good the first first day she flies out and then it rains for two days or it's cold those days. And and she only has a certain amount of time. I can't remember, but. There's X amount of days that she has to get it done before she just won't be able to. She, biologically, the, the clock is over and she just is uh, avert, you know, never gets mated and she just lays drones. And so really, I, it just, I think typically a couple flights is, is all it takes. And there's a lot of variables, I'm sure. We still don't know all the stuff in regards to this. Is she going out and she getting popped by two drones on that trip or is she getting, you know, 20? And I know it sounds kind of crazy, but uh, there's a big advantage to getting uh, your queens mated by dozens of drones. A um, lot of genetic diversity. And what's crazy is not only do the drones compete to mate with the queen, but so does the sperm. Only the most vigorous sperm is going to make it into her spermatheca, which will hold all that sperm and keep it viable. So there's a lot of genetic diversity in there, which is crucial for the colony because not all bees are good at things. Some bees are great at hygienic behavior and cleaning the hive. Some of them are terrible at that. Some are good at water gathering and some are terrible at that. Some are really good at pollen gathering and vice versa. So there is a lot of importance to that genetic diversity. And that's why when you raise your own queens in small batches, they're typically pretty cool unless they mate with a hot drone and that's all it takes is one hot drone um and then you it can be the gift that keeps on giving every time you get in that hive question on hive life i went to 2023 my first and what a great deal and at time i had at your bluegrass top it off i wish you would play one more hour <laughs> well we're thinking about shaking things up a little bit this year not tremendously but we're thinking about extending it a little bit longer for various reasons and we're still evaluating that and talking over it, and we will be talking about that more in live chats in the future. But a little bit more entertainment um, wouldn't hurt anybody. And um, But yeah, the bluegrass was quite a bit of fun, and uh, I, I really look forward to that. I used to play quite a bit, and now that's basically the only time I get to play anymore. So it's quite a bit of fun. So Robert says, do you think dipping wooden wear benefits virus resistance? I don't think it does. Um, I, I don't think it goes either direction. I could be wrong. Um, but some people do say if you wax dip your boxes because you're sealing the inside too, that will retard propolis production, which propolis is important for the colony. However, I've, I've run painted boxes way longer than I have wax dipped. They show no signs of having any issues and slowing down on their propolis production. Actually, it is too much, if anything, in those wax dip boxes. It makes it quite a pain in the rear. I know it's healthy for the bees, but wax dipping does not retard propolis production at all. If anything, it might be more aggressive. They, they like wax dip boxes. Um, there was a um, ECP said, came in how many days? Oh, oh, already got to that one. Whoops. Um, this is me trying to get ahead of you, Chris. Sorry. You did a great show. So what's the next date and promotion code? Want to stay at the uh, Connected Suite. So I don't have any hotels lined up yet. They will be available probably sometime around July. Some of them won't even give us anything until September um, because, you know, it's the, it's in the, the next year and that's just the way they run their system. Um, but we will keep you posted. And we should be more on top of it this year. You know, keep in mind, even though we're one of the biggest conferences in North America, uh, we are still fairly green. The only reason our conference works so good is because we've got a great team and we just work our butts off um, to make up for our lack of experience. But we're starting to get experience too, so watch out. 
Um, but thanks for the compliments. Um, the next date is the 4th, 5th, and 6th. So be on the lookout for that. I think you start a hive life just for your bluegrass. There, hey, you know, maybe just a little bit, but uh, that was one of my first thoughts when we started. I'm like, you know what? And because, I mean, let's, let's face it. Um, two whole days of just sitting down listening to lectures is a lot. So this is the way I look at it. I mean, we need to break it up a little bit, a little bit of bluegrass and a really cool trade show. And uh, the guys, um, you know, the, the judge, the honey judge just, just put on a spec spectacular display of honey it was just monstrously um cool it was awesome and so we, we just want a lot of cool stuff it's bees it should be cool they're the coolest thing ever so why should our conference be anything less than fun and awesome just like the bees are kevin howard i think i think that's march winds bringing april showers april showers bring may flowers which that's what i always heard growing up i was born in indiana and what i actually find in tennessee um, is March showers bring April flowers for us, but we, you know, we are a month ahead of Indiana too. Um, but basically same song, second verse, that kind of stuff. We have reached the two hour mark and I got to let you go. I told Laurel, we keep this around an hour and a half. I have gone past it again. I've got a lot of stuff. We got a trip tomorrow and, um, grabbing some, uh, glass uh, honey jars and a couple of uh, new things that you're fixing to meet in the future. I'm not going to spoil the surprise yet, but it is going to be on a live chat in uh, the next one probably. And uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty wild. But thanks, uh, Vanderpool uh, Farms, for saying so uh, so many nice things about our our information we try to be as factual as possible don't always get it right um so I, and and harry um you know he might sound like a fan but harry's more experienced and a better beekeeper than i am he's a commercial beekeeper and uh and definitely someone that i i really respect his opinion i really appreciate him taking the time out of his day to come on to our youtube channel he's been a, a very informative on bee source and other uh, platforms over the years and has actually encouraged me to do certain things differently, um, especially when it comes to introducing queens. Uh, Harry's got a, a great way and uh, opinion on that. Um, I, and I think the thing that he always follows it up with is um, no monkey motions, no cockamamory monkey motions involved. That's right. And uh, words to live by. Um, so John, says are you really going to stop at my question i didn't see that question and they'll just keep coming but all right so we'll we're going to get to one more one one more i'm in texas is it too early to add a super i only have foundation do i need to stop feeding sugar syrup a lot depends on your area in texas um how strong are your bees but if they're running out of room in the boxes that they're in they definitely need more space um, ideally in a first year colony i want to draw out two deeps if i'm running two deeps for brood i want two deeps of brood drawn out brood combs and then once we almost get that second one drawn we're gonna we're probably still lacking three to four frames of a foundation from being drawn we want to put a box of honey supers a foundation on and so if that's mediums for you then then do that and, and go ahead and put that on and you'll probably want to keep feeding unless you think you can make honey in the first year but um, you'll have to talk to your local people about that. Typically in Tennessee, I don't expect any honey the first year because if you get them in April, our flow starts in April, and those colonies aren't big enough to make a honey crop typically until uh, late May, and our flow stops in early June. So there's really not much point. We're just focused about building a lot of comb production, so you might consider feeding. But talk to some of your local uh, guys who understand your season better. I don't know really the shape of your colony and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, that's the last, last question for the night. Thanks, everybody, for hopping on. Um, we will probably do this two weeks from now, and I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.